Uh, welcome again, and uh, here we go. We have a lot of stuff to, to catch up on. Last week, we really, we, we really got involved in uh, what I think was extremely important thing, and you received page 105, which was able to, I think, allow us to arrive at very strong circumstantial evidence. And circumstantial evidence means nobody can prove anything, however, the evidence was very, very good that it was the ancient Greeks who were the people from 4555. That we gave you the lineup of these people who all of a sudden came together. And they knew about atoms, they knew about mathematics, they knew about astronomy, uh, they knew about medicine, they gave the foundation of the world's civilization, and they all had come and congregated in one place. And we were concerned about 4555 because, as you know, um, that was provided as a number in what is called the Coptic key. And the Coptics of Egypt had developed that key and the number 4555. But what we found out was that where 4555 originated, was in the schools of Alexandria, Egypt, which was presided over by the Greek Clement of Alexandria and the Greek theologian uh, Origen. So here then we had very strong circumstantial evidence that that number, 4555, came from the Greeks. Now the second thing that, if you will remember, uh, we found the number 4555 in the book of Daniel when the arm came or the hand without the arm came and wrote the word M-E-N-E, -E, Mena, Mena wrote it twice and the word M-E-N-E -E means number and the value of each letter in Hebrew was 4555. So this restraints, so you say, well how, you know, how would it be in this Hebrew part of the Old Testament would that then coordinate with the 4555 of the Coptic key? And the reason is that this Bible was written entirely by Greeks. Even the Jewish part, the Hebrew part, was written by Greeks. And how this occurred was that it, it took place in what they call Hellenistic Egypt, which was the Greek part of Egypt, and out of Alexandria, which was the Hellenistic site. And the Jews even there who had worked on the Bible had long ago forgotten how even to speak or write in the Hebrew language. And so they were reading in Greek, they were writing in Greek, and everything was in Greek. That's why in the Bible you have the story of Jesus, who is a Greek name, coming on a white horse. And the reason is because the people who wrote it, having their you know, associations with the Greek culture, knew of Pegasus. So all of these things came together, and then we looked at the people the Aristotle, Diogenes, Zeno, uh, Plato, Socrates, and all of these people said, God, where do these people come from? In the middle of all of this ignorance and sheep sellers and rock splitters were these brilliant minds. Where could they have possibly come from? Well, now we're finding that for some strange reason, out of the midst of these people came the number 45 55. And in the Bible itself, mene, mene, number, number, 45, 55. And we develop the fact that 45, 55 is the number of a galaxy in a constellation in, uh, called Coma, C-O-M-A, which is mother and child. So then we would have, I think, the, the right to say, well, <laughs> wait a minute now. Could it be that 4555, the constellation, is uttered by these people or taught by these people for whatever reason because that's where they really came from? Now, I don't mean that they came down on spaceships, you know, from 4555. I mean that they came down as waves of light entered into fetuses inside human bodies and grew up, like everyone does, in a fairly normal way, 
but then as they developed, they started to find their way back to their roots and their origins. And in this particular case, they all congregated in this one place. Greece, yes, but also Hellenist, what they call Hellenistic Egypt. And what's interesting about that is to have all of these Greek minds, uh, which were talking about the atom and so forth, uh, in Egypt, near the pyramids, and, and, and all of the, uh, the, the, the astronomical wonders that were knowledgeable to the people of Egypt. And now I'm thinking, my goodness, wait a minute here. We, it is? What struck me as so interesting here is the fact that here now we have these brilliant people in Egypt. And they were the ones who taught about astronomy and the planets and so forth. And then we think of the pyramids. And now, you know, I have to consider 4555 and the construction of the pyramids. Because if indeed it was the people of Hellenistic or Greek Egypt, the uh, Plato's of the world and so forth, who gave us 4555, they were also there at the time of, of, of the pyramids, and, and you'd say, gosh, could this be where it came from? So we have now a lot of deep circumstantial evidence that indeed these people that we've called these ancient, the, the ancient Greeks were the ones from 4555, okay? So we keep that. And of course, we know that that Coptic Gnostic, two words, Coptic, okay? The word Coptic is a Greek word that means Egyptian. That's what it is. And the second word is Gnostic, G-N-O-S-T-I-C, which means knowledge, you know, diagnosis, prognosis. The Coptic Gnostic school from which 4555 came, from which the symbol of eight came, and Azogio, the Coptic key, was in Alexandria, Egypt, which was a Greek city. And it was headed up, the school there was headed up by Clement of Alexandria, whose real name was Titus Flavius of Egypt, of, of Greece and origin, okay? Now, now, how does all this work? Because what I'm going to propose to you, that meditation, which you take part in, actually works on a scientific principle that can be duplicated in a laboratory. I mean, there is an actual and factual thing that happens when you meditate and it can be proven. Because, you know, I mean, you, you come in, you sit down in a dark room, you say, oh, you know, what am I doing here? Nothing's happening. This is nuts and all of this stuff. Because we don't understand what happens in the unseen scientific world, what happens in the unseen world within the human body, what happens in the unseen world of the universe. We don't understand that. It's not good enough to simply meditate and say, things are going to happen. How do you know? Or well, let's send energy to so-and-so. How do you know you can do that? How do you do that? You wouldn't know how to do that. You just say, well, I'll have faith. But see, that's what you shouldn't have. That's the destroyer. Having faith is destructive. Because when you have faith, you are simply saying, I'm not going to find out. I'm not going to try to understand. I'm just going to believe whatever they say. Because if I tell you something and you're going to say, you have faith, you don't have faith in what I told you. You had faith in me. When you go to, you, we, we have, you go to churches, you say, well, I have faith in God. No, you don't. You have faith in that particular church's version of God because you have nobody else to tell you. So the point then is you've got to abandon faith. The most destruct, one of the most destructive words in the world is faith because it totally uh, cuts you off from understanding and from finding and from experimenting and seeking and, and, and logically looking at who you are and what part you play in this world. And, and there, you know, a lot of people are guided by the Bible. And if you look at page 979 of the Bible, you'll see that it says right there, you should not have faith. I mean, it's in the book. So I'm not telling people anything that the Bible doesn't say. The Bible says you must abandon faith. It's in the book of Hebrews. And it's in Hebrews um, 6. 
Hebrews 6, chapter 1. And it says, leaving the principles of the doctrines of Christ, go on to perfection. Perfection is that place that the Greeks talked about, deep within the, uh, that dark place where the light is, where there is no touch of thought. Go on to perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God. You shouldn't have faith towards God. The Bible's saying, do not have faith towards God. How could you have faith towards God? Because the only thing you know about God is what somebody else told you. You have to find that. You have to experience that. You have to understand how it works. Because you, got, you have to be able to say somewhere that this really happens. So, and in, 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 in knowing that, you have to find out how it really happens. We studied the Bible, and here you have the Bible, and everybody comes on television and tells you it's the Word of God. And then the amazing thing is they'll use the word logos. And you can see it, in, and you go into Christian bookstores, the logos, you know, the word of God. One thing that the word logos does not mean is word. It does not mean word. In fact, it's the root of the word logic. The word logos means the principles governing the cosmos. It means the principles that govern the relationship between the cosmos and, and you. And the word cosmos means the universe regarded as a harmonious whole. And, and so then logos is the principle governing the cosmos and the cosmos as a universal orderly whole. You are part of it. The earth are part of it. You are part of the earth. You and the earth are part of the sky. And, and on and on and on and on and on. But we haven't understood that. We've never, we've never even thought about that. I mean, we've been studying 45, 55 here for, what, two years? I don't believe there's another person on the planet Earth that even knows the, word, the number. I don't believe there's another person that's ever mentioned it. I've looked in all kinds of, of uh, computer software, Encyclopedia is, I mean, no, 45, 55. Have you ever heard anybody mention it? No. no. And what did I show you last week? I showed you on the overhead, where I was the manager in, in, uh, for a Comcast cable in Bricktown, and there they had a tower, and I found and I showed you the location of that tower according to the Federal Aviation Administration, the coordinates of the latitude. The latitude is west 4555. Is that curious? What do you think about that? How could I have how could I have four, how could I ha how could I have that latitude, 4555, and, and be the only one here in the world talking about this? I mean, you saw it. And, and, and it's here. I just don't want to pull that thing out again. But we showed it on the overhead last week. I showed it to you. <sighs> Pythagoras. Pythagoras. The father of mathematics. The one who developed the harmonies of, of do, re, mi, fa, sol. I mean, brilliant mind, Pythagoras. What did the guy say? He said, I have lived before. And he said, not only did I live before, but I have been allowed to remember where I was. And so the Pythagoreans taught the transmigration of the soul, like teleportation of photon. He actually said that. He actually said that. Oh, it's part of the Pythagorean philosophy. But well, you're going to say, this guy's a nut? <coughs> Pythagoras, the father of mathematics, is a nut? Because you're going to take his mathematics, which we have, you can't drop the fact that he said, I've lived before, and I've been given the ability to remember where I was. And so if you look up Pythagoras in any type of encyclopedia, whatever, you look at the Pythagorean theory, and you find part of it is the transmigration of the souls, teleportation. That's what they taught. That's what he believed in. Aristotle. Aristotle, the first book that he wrote was called Metaphysics. 
Pythagoras said it is through the principle of mathematical ratio that the natural harmony of music arises. They said, where did you get do, re, mi, fa, so, la, ti, do? He said, oh, it's no problem. It's the planets. Well, how would you know? No problem. You know, that's uh, feeding back a little bit. Could, could somebody, go, John, could you go and just lower that a little bit? They would say to Pythagoras, how would you know what the planets sound like? And I could hear what he said. I've been there. Well, like the yeah, uh, just, just, a, just a teeny bit. Okay? It's that big, the big knob there. Huh? Okay, I think it's fine. I said, how, you know, how could you possibly know this? We've shown the harmony of Apollo. What's the harmony? What, what is Pythagoras saying? Listen to what he's saying. He's saying the principle of mathematical ratio that the natural harmony of music arises. Well, here's supernova 1987a. And that's a natural phenomenon. That's in the sky right now. We're talking about that. We're waiting for things to happen. But then you take that Greek mathematical um, ratio and you put it over the top of that and suddenly then you find there's a connection. Something has happened here. That mathematical ratio, that mathematical diagram turns out to fit perfectly with this natural phenomenon which is uh, supernova 1987a. But that's the understanding of logos. That is what you call the word, not a book. Do, <laughs> You know, it's an interesting thing. If you ever get into a Bible discussion, you'll find everybody's got a different Bible and all of them are different because books are that way. Anytime there's a book, people can change the book. You can't change supernova. So we've taken you deep into the myths of ancient Greece. We've showed you the relationship to the Bible. We've taken you up the river Styx with the small gray boatman. Remember the little guy whose color is gray? His name is Sharon. And he has that boat and he takes you between these trees that are hanging over in the dark waters. You hear screaming and all of this stuff. And then he takes you up to that stream to the right to Elysium and all of this kind of business. But you say, what does that have to do with the cosmos? I mean, it's a, you know, what it has to do with the cosmos is that Sharon in his little boat takes you to Hades. Hades is a, that's still feeding back. Can't you hear? Uh, do you hear that? Yeah. Uh, Hades, astronomically to the Greeks, is Pluto. And surrounding Pluto is a small gray satellite. And the name of that satellite is Charon. So I mean, these things are, when you, when you hear of Sharon and you hear of the names of all of these different gods and goddesses, they actually represent, they actually represent planets and, and organs of, of the universe. The myths, just like the Bible talked about gods, but they weren't really talking about gods, they were talking about the cosmos, the universe, and the part that the human body plays in harmony with it. And this is what Socrates said. The beginning of philosophy is a sense of wonder. You know, that's, that's still... <sighs> let's, go, let's, go back then to what, let's go back then to what Socrates said. The beginning of philosophy is a sense of wonder. Nature and the universe evoke wonder. There is more to the nature of reality than what we can touch and see. That's the key to this whole thing. See, that takes you to the world of the invisible. And that's where we miss the world of the subatomic, the world of quantum, the world inside of each one of you, the place where you dwell. The true reality of your nature is the invisible world. But yet, Everything that we've ever been through in our lives through religion is completely consumed in what you can see, what you can feel. And that's not, that's not what it is because if you don't have the part of you that's invisible, you can't have the part of you that's physical. The invisible part is the part where your true personality resides. 
And we've neglected that because we, you know, we can't understand it. Well, we couldn't understand it in the Middle Ages. I understand that. And then the church could be justified and say, well, you have to take it on faith. But no longer. The quantum laws govern the operation of things called photons, electrons, atoms, and you're made of all of them. You are atoms. That's all you are, atoms. And so what happens to those atoms governs you and your relationship with life. If you're all atoms, you're all electrons. Because that's everything that's in atoms, is electrons and photons, and that's what you're made of. But all the time you went to church, nobody ever told you about those things. They said, you have to have faith. Oh, the spirit moved it. No, it didn't. An electron moved. Why not? Oh, I can't believe that. That makes sense. <laughs> what will my pastor say? They say, that's of the devil. That's all they ever say when they don't know what the heck they're talking about is that's of the devil. But now, let me see. See these things here, photons, electrons, and atoms? They are not subject to birth and decay. They exist. They have no origins. They, they have no end. They change to go here and there as they wish without beginning and end. And if you look in the Bible, it says in Hebrews 7, 2 on page 980, to whom Abraham gave a tenth of all, to the king of righteousness, the king of peace, without father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning nor end, but made like unto the son, abideth. A so there's a cosmic laws of the subatomic, and it goes in the Bible under the name of Melchizedek. There was no such thing. How can a person not have a mother and father, no beginning or no end? But these things do. And how do you give Melchizedek a tenth? When you meditate. When you separate from that which is recognized as the 10% of the left side of the brain. So everything in, in life, in your life, has been based on what you can feel, what you can experience, what you can see, your whole religion has been based on that principle. I remember when I went through, I went through this, the born again thing, and I mean, you know, people were claiming things and waving hundred dollar bills and were ten dollar bills, and, you know, not waving hundred, were waving a dollar, and said, "Because the guy said he's going to get a hundred back." No, what's going to happen is you're going to lose the one you got in your hand. That's what's going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> And it's true, everybody knows, but can laugh. we all went through that stuff. I mean, I'll try it, but I need, someone's going to tell me, here, well, if you put up one, you get 100 back. But I lost the one, and that's the end of it. I never thought of it again. I just remember Jim Baker used to come on, well, these people gave 1,000, and out of nowhere came a call, the guy gave him a job, and all this stuff, and then what happened to him? He went to jail. <laughs> what did he get? But he just got married, good, good for him, so what the heck. But you see, the point is, when you dwell on that physical, that's okay, because that's very important. I, I mean, I want that. The physical part is the best part, I think. That's where ice cream is, and Monica, and all this stuff, you know? That's, that's where it is. I really want to get rid of that. Because as bad as Bubba looks, I mean, he haven't really had a good time, you know? And so, I mean, back with it, you know? He'll do all right. But the point is, you keep that. And that's fine, you have to keep that. But don't cut off the other very important part. And that is the invisible world which moves in mysterious ways to eventually manifest into the things that you are. Without the invisible, there can be no physical. We all have been trapped in a dungeon, in bondage of religion, the dungeon of ignorance. You know, you can't, can't say anything. That's why I'm a little bit afraid of what I'm seeing, you know, in the papers now about all the sex stuff. And, and that's the way these things happen. So, you know, it happened in Nazi Germany that way and everything. All of a sudden they start looking in people's bedrooms and then they start, you know, getting mothers to can you tell me what your daughter did. With, did she have sex with so-and-so? And then start wiretapping people and getting on the phones and all of this stuff. It's, it's really dangerous stuff. And that's what they do, and that's exactly the way it happened over there. And everybody said, no, that's nothing. We're just trying to keep law and order. No, <laughs> no they're not. But anyhow, there was a guy, we all know Plato. Plato wrote an allegory, and maybe sometimes, 
if you ever, you know, Plato was one of those guys that lived a couple thousand years before Jesus, but different than Jesus, there was no doubt that he lived. I mean, this guy really did. He wrote books and everything. And Plato wrote an allegory called The Cave. It was very interesting. And he described the very thing that we simply don't understand the nature of ourselves or the world that we inhabit. And Plato said, we're prisoners in a dark dungeon and we're all chained to a wall. And our, that's our governments, our religions, our traditions. You're not allowed. You're not allowed to, to think or believe anything but what you're told. But Plato said, we see a glimmer of, of light through a crack in the ceiling and we see things moving like shadows, and basically that's our first instincts. Our instincts start telling us that, hey, there's more to this. And we go to church, and we do everything everybody else does, and we fold our hands like this, and we walk down, we put handkerchiefs on, and we do all this kind of stuff. But in our minds, we're saying, what the heck is this? I mean, is, is, this, is this what life is about? I mean, there are people starving, and yet the people with robes are at altars. I mean, is this what this is? I mean, what the heck is going on? But we have a reluctance to say anything because we're afraid that if we say anything, our captors will get mad at us. Even a little kid, you know, you don't dare say you don't believe this stuff. I, I, had, I, had, I had religious people when I was a little kid say, they used to call me Master Donahue. Mm. I was only this big, they said, we're afraid of you, Master Donahue. And I didn't know why at that time, because I was only this high. Because I used to tell them that I didn't believe, I didn't think, I didn't think this stuff is true. I was only a little thing. And you didn't do that, but I did. So they threw me out. <laughs> <laughs> and you were, yeah. But so that's the true world, the dungeon of darkness. We're chained together. And yet there's a glimmer of light above us and we see these shadows and we know there's something else, but we, we're all chained together so and we don't dare say anything because the captors are here. But what would happen if we could escape? Plato didn't write about that, but Socrates did. And Socrates took up on Plato's cave and he said, you know, the person that escapes would initially be blinded by the light and really couldn't see. We all get into that. You come here, you've escaped. And if you don't think, you just see what these people would think of you coming in here. But you're blinded by the light, he said, and you'll still put more faith in the cave and the opinions of those who were chained down there. They say, oh, don't get involved in that. And you can't really see. You can't, everything is still, it's hard. I mean, people, I mean, I've talked to people, people, when I talk to they have, this is like, I'm telling people, Jesus wasn't crucified. Not only wasn't he crucified, didn't even exist. What? My God, you know, get the rocks, get the stones, get the lions. What could you, how could you say such a thing? Well, why not? But the point being that to me, Jesus is life, is the sun, is the universe, is the cosmos, is healing, is all things. Not a, some guy running around with these crazy people. Peter, Paul, and Mary? Why is he hanging around it? <laughs> but as our eyes become more accustomed to the light, I mean, I can tell you, that when I started into this stuff, I had more people, and the people, and the first thing when I said, Jesus, a God is not an American, some people left. What? You can't believe that. They really believed God was an American. He didn't like those people over in those other places. They know he was an American because, you know, he, we won the war. <laughs> hmm. So anyhow, finally you, you begin to look and you begin to understand people and you begin to understand each other and then you look up into the sky. I mean, just take a look at how we were in bondage with like our relationships with black people in this country. People in the 1950s, if you lived in Atlantic City and you were black, you went to the movies, you had to sit in the balcony. But now look, I mean, you know, everybody just, we found out that we, we shouldn't have been afraid of those things. They were afraid of it. It was silly. 
And that's what, that's what uh, Socrates said. You start to put importance on these new things that you found. You start to put importance on, on the universe. You start to put importance on the cosmos and all of these things. And, 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 and you look and you see the sky and the stars and the moon and, the, and you start to put importance on their relationship to you. Even though the system and your captors have, have said, warned you, don't do that, don't get involved in all of this. But now you're out and you're free and you're up into the sky and your eyes are getting accustomed to the light and you can see. You say, gee. Plato said the perception of the world is dominated by assumption and human opinion and he used the, the sun as the image of the true God, and he, the source of all reality. That's why the, the name Jesus means the sun. That's what it means. 888 in Greek is the mythical sun. The great healer. Plato studied at the Greek city of Helios, which was in Egypt, in the Hellenistic Egypt. And I get great satisfaction when I read this, and I know that what you and I have gotten together with, Plato had four pathways to knowledge. His first pathway, his first pathway was sensation, feeling, experience. W what has happened to me? And many of you have sat in dark rooms sometime and cried and said, why is this happening to me? What has happened? What's going on? And Plato says, you have to have that first. And then Plato said, the second thing is opinion. Read about your experience. Listen to what other people think about your experience. And then the third thing is, is you've got to have scientific reason to try to understand. Now try to get objective about it. What is, going, what is really going on? What is happening? Why, what, is, what kind of change is happening in the human mind of people all over the world? What, what kind of change is happening in the cosmos? And then Plato said, once you've digested all of this, then you can get into the point of direct knowledge. A new experience based on utilizations of wonders that you have discovered and how they can change you in the universe for the better. And Plato totally disagreed with religion that said, have faith. Plato said there's a higher level, a direct knowledge, a gnosis, from which comes the word Gnostic. And Plato said, when we reach this higher point, then the mind becomes one with the object of knowledge. So when we seek within ourselves to this higher level, then we come to grips with this. And, and this is what Plato said. There were two levels of expression. One, the lower world, which we are aware of right here, and he said, this, is, this world that you live in is one that is evolving, is changing, is becoming. But he said, there's another one, the upper world. And that is the same yesterday, today, and forever. It never changes. But what's this all about? What the heck am I talking about? It's all about things that are going on all around people who cannot see them, cannot feel them, and for all intention and purposes, these things don't exist. But scientists have found these things, and they've proved that they do exist. And they make everything that we experience happen. We've, we've discussed the experiment of light and photon, atoms and electrons. They start as a particle. That's a particle, a dot. Why does it start that way? Because you're looking at it. Now everybody close their eyes. You don't have to if you don't want to. But I'm going to do so. Now open your eyes. Look what happened when you closed your eyes and didn't look anymore. Remember the dot that was over there? It became a wave. Now pretend you're not looking at it. It's a wave. You know, you think I'm talking that. This is true. This is really true. You see that wave? This is energy. This is an atom. This is an electron. This is a photon. It's a wave. It flows just like a wave in the ocean, as long as you're not looking. But as soon as you turn, and as soon as you turn around and look at it, it collapses from a wave and becomes a particle. What I'm telling you is the truth of Niels Bohr, of, 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 of Zeno, the great Greek, of Stephen Hawking. I mean, this is a fact. And, 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 and what happens then is electrons, photons, 
And atoms all travel as waves. Hypothetically, because nobody can see them. But as soon as you look, they stop. Look at the light. It's a particle. Look, see what it is? Because why? You can see it. And look what happens. You have a particle. And you want to get the particle over to the screen. And you're going to run it through this board. This board's going to have two holes in it. You know what's going to happen? This particle is going to go through both of them at the same time. And you know what? And it's going to wind up over here on the screen wherever it wants to wind up. And it may not even go to the screen. It may go to Mars if it wants to. How's this possible? <coughs> it's true. Absolutely true. This is the way it happens. The photon starts as a particle. It goes through its journey as a wave. And it arrives as a particle only because somebody sees it. But still, how does it get through two holes at the same time? But it does. It gets through the two holes and it chooses to go as a dot or a particle. But how does the photon get, how does it know where to put itself on the screen? Do you know that when the, when the electrons shoot out of your tube or your television and go to the screen, some of them go to the screen and some of them go to Mars? Some of them go to Chicago? Go wherever they want to go. You don't have anything to say about that. They take the, and they put the same trajectory Everything right down to the micro inch. This is going right through here. It's got to go right there. No problem. Good. Shoot it. Boom. And it goes there. Why? Because it goes where it wants to go. And that's the stuff you're made of. These things that start as particles, dots, end as particles, dots, and travel as waves are electrons, photons, and atoms, and that's what you're, you're made of. That's what you are. And the photons may be explainable because they have no mass or electric charge, but the very same thing happens with electrons, and your body is filled with them because you're made of atoms. And what's interesting about that is, is this constant thing that is a fact that you can study, that you can look at, is that these waves continue as waves until somebody looks at them. And when somebody looks at them, they change into a particle. When somebody watches, they change. And consider something. You're filled with electrons. That's what you are. You're atoms. Every bit of you is atoms. It means you're filled with electrons. They can be manipulated using electronic and magnetic fields moving faster or slower, depending on how they are pushed or pulled. How do you receive them? Here you are. Penny. Here comes something from Pegasus as a wave. It's going to you. It knows it's going to you. But how's it going to get to you? It can't get to you until you watch. As soon as you watch, this wave collapses to a particle and arrives. Right where it's supposed to go. Bang! Pew! Aunt Lucy is sick. You want to send energy to her. You want to send a photon to her. How are you going to do it? You've got to turn. What is going to cause the waves inside you to collapse to particles? You observe. You watch. When you watch, they collapse. Then they can go. You can push them. And Aunt Lucy can watch, and she can pull them. This works. <laughs> when I said, you know, when the scientists were talking about this, they would say, wait a minute. If these waves are collapsing inside of people, it's because somebody in the universe is watching. And then Stephen Hawking said, yeah, but 
if these waves are collapsing in the universe, it means somebody outside of the universe is watching. And Albert Einstein said, this is a spooky thing <laughs> at a distance. It was actually what he called it, the spooky thing at a distance. In 1990, a team from Constance, K-O-N-S-T-A-N-Z -A -N -Z in Germany, tried the same things with atoms that had been done with photons and electrons. They couldn't see the results with atoms, but they made measurements with a detector. And atoms also travel as waves and arrive as particles. Remember I told you that you're here, but there is another part of you that is a 45. Remember? And remember I tell you the, the lady, the Muslim lady in New York told me that in the Koran, God said, when I create, I make twins. At MIT, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, they did an experiment with a beam of sodium atoms and found that a single atom passed through two holes going both ways at the same time. But they also found, please listen to this very carefully, they also found that an atom can be at two places at the same time. So all of a sudden, then the things that we used to talk about say, and you say, well, you know, yeah, I'm up there and I'm down here. Yeah, I have faith. <laughs> Forget it. It's true. It's provable. You are Adam. You're the son, the daughter of Adam. And you are two places at the same time. And you know you are because you've had deja vu. I feel like I've been here before. But I never have, but yet I feel like I have because you have. What part of you? You find this troubling because you live in a religious material world, and they said that these were spirits, but they never told you of eight or atoms or bosons or photons, and this is this unseen world which is just as important as the seen one. Somewhere between that inner, mysterious, invisible you and the atom, the quantum rule cuts out and the rule of classical physics cuts in and you, know, you go on with your physical life. And it strikes right at the concept of reality. Scientists know that electrons and photons choose a trajectory. They move as they desire and no one knows where they go. And now listen to this quote, electrons are aware of more of the world than their immediate location. And that's what Albert Einstein said, it's a spooky action. And what this is all about is what you and me call God. Did you, but, but you, how, you went to church, didn't you? And you gave 10% of your money and all, you didn't even know what, what this stuff happened. Does any of these people in any of these churches and these places are packed? Do they know? They haven't a clue to what we're talking about. There is no meaning to the existence of an electron in space. The electron springs into existence when you observe it. Your brain is filled with them. When you meditate, what do you do? You seek within yourself. You look within yourself. You observe within yourself. And when you do that, the electrons, the photons, the atoms, which connects you to God, springs into existence. And what did Jesus say? What I say to you, I say to all. Watch. Watch what? Just watch. Watch yourself and bring to life all of these things which are flowing through the great electromagnetic web as a wave, bring them into particles so they come to that screen and register on your screen of life and say, this is the way. What causes electrons' wave function to collapse inside of the human body is when somebody looks. That's what Hawking said. Who the heck is looking? John Wheeler who is a physicist, states that it is only the presence... Okay, listen, 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 listen to this one, Albert. Listen to this one. John Wheeler. It is only the presence of conscious observers in the form of ourselves that have collapsed the wave function 
and made the universe exist. Without an observer, there can be nothing. That's what I tell you. When everybody walks out of this room, it doesn't exist. It's gone. Oh, yes, it is. It's there. No, it's not. It's not here until you look at it. It goes away. Oh, I could put a camera. You put a camera, you destroy it. You destroy it. It's then somebody's observing. But without an observer, it goes away. Consider inside of you photons, electrons, start as a dot, a particle. You observe, and it moves outward into a wave. It is coming towards you from the planets, coming towards you from Pegasus. You observe, and it arrives as a particle through the pineal gland of the brain. It's important to understand something. In the laboratory experiment, the individual photon or electron chooses the screen on which it will collapse. There are messages being sent to you from places distant from here, from 4555, from Andromeda, from Pegasus to the hippocampus. And it is a message that's destined for everybody here, but who's watching? It can't get here. It becomes a wave, and it just flows and bypasses you until you watch. But when you watch, it collapses into a particle, and then it can come to the screen. Don't you see? It can't get from here to where it's supposed to get, because it's going to be going like that, and it's going to go right past it. But as soon as there is an observer on your screen, inside of you, that wave collapses. Here you are. It becomes a particle. It goes right there, and it spells out the instructions to you. This is what you have to do. How did you get that message? Because you collapsed the wave function, and it became a particle, and it hit the board it was destined to hit. And what does the Bible say, Matthew 25? Watch, for you neither know the day nor the hour when the Son of Man comes. Ma Mark 13, 37, what I say to you, I say to all, watch. Daniel 4, 13, I love this. I saw in the visions of my head upon my bed, and behold, a watcher. Daniel 4, 23, and the king saw a watcher coming down from heaven, saying, hew the tree down and destroy it. So now we consider that it is the act of watching the wave that makes it collapse and become a particle within you. It is the act of meditation because there is no other way that you can look, observe, watch within yourself other than meditation. Otherwise, what I am telling you, what is a quantum physics fact, otherwise if you're not doing this, all of the messages that are coming from this universe specifically to you to go on the board inside of you are passing over you like a wave. And you're missing your mail. You have email. <laughs> a moving, please just bear with me. I know I'm a little bit long, but just bear with me. Now we have a moving atom or photon or electron, this is a very important, arrives where it wills. You cannot predict it. The question is, can the one who dispatches the energy direct it? Do you direct it to somewhere else? You do by watching. You see the electron dispatched, it could go to Mars. You could dispatch an electron from your brain and it can go to Mars. And it's going to be a wave into infinity until somebody watches. And then somebody watches and they say, Ah, uh, number 876, do you know of Gloria Mino? What the heck is that? This guy's up on another planet somewhere. Now, remember we discussed earlier that electrons are aware of more than their immediate location. I want, to just tell, I want you to stay with me with this. Let's get through this, and then we'll go, because this is important. Electrons are aware of more than their immediate location. They are aware of conditions throughout the entire experiment in the laboratory. And Stephen Hawking said, if they are aware of conditions in the entire experiment, then they are aware of conditions throughout the entire universe. We are made of them. We cause them to collapse. Let us consider photons. If we're photons, photons are angles of light. 
messengers as science refers to them. Now listen to this. When a photon interacts with other particles through the electromagnetic force, they become influenced by stronger forces. They become influenced by cosmic forces. The point that I'm trying to make here is that they can be influenced by what we call God and move as messenger particles accordingly. Now, listen to this one. Consider if a photon collides with a proton. Photon collides with a proton. And this one is great. Wait, this is great. The photon collides with the proton. What happens then? I even have to read this. There are things called, hypothetical things called quarks. Okay? These things called quarks will interact from the photon with quarks inside of the proton. No, I think it's just, just what I'm saying. When the quarks inside of the photon interact with quarks in front of the proton, they create something new, something different. Something else happens. In other words, what the scientists have found out, that light, whoa, light photon, by interacting with something else, can become matter and then change back into light again. In other words, there's nothing there. It's light. All of a sudden, there's a guy standing over there. Who the heck is that? Did you ever see him before? No. He said something very strange, or he helped me, or she helped me, or whatever. And I turned around. Is it possible? Oh, yes. The angle of light interacting with something else can instantly change into matter and then back into light again, like that. And you know what? I'm not talking about hocus pocus. I'm talking about a fact. The messenger particle, the angle of light, can become a person and then a messenger particle. The person appears as a physical entity and you turn around and it's gone because it's back to an angle of light, just like that. Why? because the photon quark has interacted with the proton quark and formed something new. What we don't know is amazing. I want to just read you something by John Gibbons, who is a PhD in astrophysics at Cambridge University. I'm almost done. Could you, could you stay with me for about five more minutes? Listen to what he says. Because there's really something here that I want to show you to, to wrap this up that's really neat, okay? I spent my life doing this stuff. That's why, you know, I stay up till 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning in the dark going nuts. Quant this is what John Gibbon says. Quantum exists as a superposition of states unless something from the outside causes the wave function to collapse. I mean, we're not talking here about some minister or some evangelist. This guy's a, is a scientist. What did I say? Cambridge University. In other words, these things exist in states beyond our knowledge until something outside of their mysterious existence occurs. But what happens if we keep watching that particle all the time? In the modern version of a paradox made famous by the Greek philosopher Zeno. You know the list you have on page 105? The last name on that list is Zeno. And there is a guy who lived thousands of years ago who discussed quantum physics and is quoted in quantum physics books in 1998. How did he, but, but this is what I want to know from you. Who the heck told him? Where did he go to school? He lived 500 years before the Jesus story came up. What he says, a watched atom can never change. You know, what, you know what Zeno said? You pull an arrow, and you think the arrow moves. It doesn't. Oh, yes, it does. I say, no, 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 no. Every instant, it's here. And now it's there. Now it's there. But every time is an instant. In other words, what Zeno said, you cannot step in the same river twice. 
because it's moving. It's changing. So every time you step in it, it's a different river. It gets complicated, but that, this is what this guy was taught. This is the way life is. But Gibbons goes on. L listen to this. We're almost done. Even if you prepare the atom in some unstable, excited, high-energy state, if you keep watching it, the atom will stay in that state forever, trembling on the brink, but only able to jump down to a more stable, lower energy when nobody is looking. A watched quantum pot never boils. Now this, what follows, is what we'll, we'll wrap this up with, and this is very important. And just let me have this, because I want to show you something that I think is sensational and very exciting. Okay? All right. Gibbons goes on to describe electromagnetic radiation moving across the universe like ripples on the surface of a pond. Here? Now, let's see. Here's the, here's the universe. I mean, here's planets up here. But here comes electromagnetic ra radiation moving across the universe like ripples on the surface of a pond. As waves move forward, they interact with waves moving backward. In other words, energy coming from up here, they all start to interact with one another, and they're coming from this way, and they're coming from all over the place. Now listen to this. As waves move forward, you got that? They interact with waves move backward. As a result then, each individual charged particle, electron, proton, including each electron, including the ones inside of your body, are instantaneously aware of their position in relation to all other charged particles in the universe. In other words, every charged little electron inside of your body knows exactly where it is and exactly who it should be in touch with. I didn't say this. Evangelist, pastor, priest didn't say this. These people are very, very substantial minds in 1998 that are saying this, and they have experimented with this, and they know it's a fact. Now listen to what Gibbons goes on to say. This is what I love. Waves traveling backwards provide feedback, which makes every charged particle an integrated part of the whole universal electromagnetic web. The web. When you touch the web, the spider knows. And as soon as you touch that web, as soon as you vibrate that web, the spider comes. Just like that. If you look on page, you don't have to do it now because we're late, but if you look on stuff 25, you see that inside of your skull, is something called arachnoid, which is the web. Even a spider is called the arachnoid. So there are 12 cranial nerves, 12 constellations, 12 signs of the zodiac. You have 10% of your brain on the left side, and stuff 63 tells you that we can only see 10% of the universe. Now we learn of the universal electromagnetic web and then we see that in the brain we have arachnoid, which is in the brain. And when you just touch that electron. It sends a signal up the web. And the spider knows somebody's there. And Dr. Gibbons tells us that every charged particle is an integrated part of the whole web. And listen to what he says. Listen to what he says. And, and I will show you. Dr. John Gibbons of the University of Cambridge says this poke an electron here in a lab on the Earth and every charged particle in the Andromeda galaxy more than two million light years away knows that it happened. Poke an electron on Pegasus and every charged particle right down to the Pegasus inside of you which is the hippocampus knows that the message has been sent. Our 
our electron here on Earth knows where it is in relation to charged particles elsewhere. And just think of this for a minute. If our electron knows where Pegasus is, then Pegasus knows for sure where our electron and you know that inside of you, Pegasus is the hippocampus of the brain, the place of memory. So now you see that as you watch, you observe the electron, the photon moves, and the vibration reaches to the most distant places, including 4555. And as you watch, the vibration moves as a wave looking for you, waving across the universe looking for you, waiting for you to watch, waiting for you to observe, waiting for you to look, and as soon as you watch, and as soon as you observe, it collapses and comes streaming down to the pineal, into the blackboard, into the whiteboard of your heart, and gives you the message of life. This is the subatomic quantum proof of meditation and the movement that we have previously misunderstood as spirit. So we can put this together with how the myths express deep, mysterious troops and considering the webs and the vibrations in the ancient times, the universe was made up of the seven gods, the moon, Mercury, Venus, the sun, so forth. They didn't know of Uranus and Pluto. But consider this perceived highway as the movement up and down the web. And they felt these planetary gods or these planets were connected with the outermost realm of the eternal. When they said, and Zeno said, you can't step in the same river twice, he, he added, but humans have a transcendent nature capable of knowing the higher. And Orpheus said, I am a child of the earth and starry heaven, but my race is of heaven. So each is, a, is of the higher race, but we've got to be the watcher. We've got to observe, and we've got to be ready to receive which comes, and then gently move the web so that the one at the center will be alerted to the fact we are here. Thank you very much for uh, sharing this time with me. See you. Bye-bye.